Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to this virtual live session. I'm Aswani from People Matters, and I will be your host for today. Before we begin, I would like to wish a very happy Women's Day. In order to celebrate this lovely day, People Matters and Sunstone Adversity are excited and glad to present to you a power-packed panel discussion on the topic, Are You Empowering Women to Embrace Leadership Rules? The past few months have witnessed women leaders take great strides in driving incredible impact for the business community at large. From Lena Nair becoming the first ever woman CEO of Chanel to Falguni Nair kickstarting the IPO of her very own brand, Nika, making headlines. The time has come to expand such leadership opportunities to women at large. Organizations must recognize and elevate the potential they hold, and recruitment is one of the first steps in making this possible. With leading educational institutes investing great efforts in making learning opportunities accessible to all at different stages of their professional lives, recruiters have access to an expanded talent pool. And this expansion impacts the potential women hold and the role they can play in the growth and success of your organizations. To encourage recruiters in expanding their choice when it comes to hiring, People Matters and Sunstone Adversity are excited to bring to you the second session of Talent Talks, which will discuss at length the key role played by recruitment processes in empowering and encouraging women to take the next step in their professional careers and embrace the late leaders in them. To facilitate the esteemed women panelists today, I would like to hand over the session for moderation to Alekia Chakrabarti, Head of Marketing, Sunstone Adversity. Alekia Chakrabarti is the Head of Marketing at Sunstone Adversity. With a career spanning 12 years, Alekia has, ex has extensive experience of leading global innovations, communication and brand management to his credit in large organizations such as Nestle, Unilever and ITC. It's great to have you with us, Alekia. And now over to you to introduce our panelists for the session. Thank you, Asmani. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, obviously, uh, to start off with a very, very happy moments to all of you who are watching this and then also you know the really power pack panel that I'm about to introduce. Uh, thanks to everyone for People Matters as well. So giving us the opportunity. Uh, so without further ado, I would just like to introduce our first panelist for the day and for the session, Ekta Singh, CHRO at AGS Health. Uh, she is the CHRO Global for AGS Health in a role yes, she's in a role and is all the gamut of HR, CSR, DNI, branding and communications responsibilities. She has more than 25 years of progressive experience in talent delivery, recruitment, talent management, benefits, compensation, staffing, diversity and inclusion. Ekta, there is so much we need to talk about today and, and, and I look forward to the chat. She started her career in the year 1996 with CMC Limited and has worked in India and abroad in organizations like Capgemini, Deloitte. RBS, Corpus, etc. She wears many hats and is a speaker, trainer, executive coach, writer, and thought leader. A very, very warm welcome to you, Ekta. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to call upon Susan. Susan Matthew, HR lead, business partner in India, r and International at LinkedIn. A people-oriented uh, HR leader with strong leadership. Now, Susan has business acumen and interpersonal skills that help her in driving organizational talent strategies. She has extensive experience partnering with executive teams to analyze, determine, and implement HR solutions focused on achieving business results. She has been recognized as a quick learner and consistent high performer with a passion for building strong teams and acting as a mentor and coach to professionals as they grow their careers. Welcome to you, Susan. Thank you very much, Alekia. And uh, International Women's Day wishes to all the women also on this uh, session today. Thank you for joining us. Great, great. And really looking forward to chatting with you as well. Uh, next, we have Shweta, Shweta Mishra, Director HR and Firm Compliance with Indus Valley Partners, a HR professional with over 17 years of experience across industries like IT, finance, and consulting. Uh, Shweta has hands-on experience of an array of HR domains, including HR strategy, employee engagement, performance management, change management, talent and leadership development, business partnering, facilitation, content development, and diversity initiatives. In her current role, Shweta heads HR and compliance globally for a 600 plus strong fintech form a very warm welcome to you as well thank you Aleka. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, happy women's day to all the panelists here thank you super 
Next, I'd like to call Babita, head HR at Eagle Wise Finance, uh, and just the the you know the power pack panel just gets stronger and stronger. Uh, experienced people, leader with a demonstrated history of working in the financial services industry at domestic and global level, skilled in HR transformation, change management, HR tech solutions adoption, business HR advisory, a solutionist on talent attraction and management agendas, passionate in driving diversity and inclusion, leadership development. Again, a very very warm welcome to you, Babita. Thank you, Alekya, and uh, happy International Women's Day to everybody. Super. Last but not the least, I'd like to call upon Samta Samta Arora, head of learning at Sunstone University. She's the head of learning at uh, the organization that I also work in. She's an education leader with 15 years in the education and learning sector, and has led academics and curriculum for tech companies, education institutions, and think tanks. And more, more importantly, she has been my friend for the last four months since I, I became a colleague of hers at Sunstone. So a very warm welcome to you, Samta. Thank you so much, Alekha. You know, uh, extremely excited to be part of the panel uh, with all of you, and very happy Women's Day to everybody who's watching this webcast. Super, super. So before we begin, in fact, you know, uh, I, I come from a, a conventional Bengali family, uh, which is matriarchal in a lot of ways. And in fact, eight March happens to be the birthday of two of my sisters. So if uh, Jasmita and Sanjita are watching this, happy birthday to both of you. And, and, and on that note, uh, I, I'll just uh, begin the conversation. Let's start the session with something that I have for each one of you, you know, panelists here, all five of you. Uh, can you give me one powerful word, you know, that defines Women's Day? As a leader, to you, one word, maybe starting with you, Ekta. Happy uh, Women's Day to all my colleagues who are listening to me. One powerful word, I think, for me is courage. Courage. Okay, wonderful. I pass the baton on to Susan. Inclusion. Okay. Shweta. Freedom. Nice. It, it just gets better. Courage, inclusion, freedom. Okay, Babita. Transformation. Transformation. Okay, we, we we aim to bring some transformation by the time this talk ends. I think at least in thought level, right? So okay, great. Samta. Uh, voice. Super. Yeah, and and I'll we'll, of course you know voice. What is there in our hearts and heads, right? So as we go along, great. That's some great energy for all five of you. Uh, let's move on to our discussion. Lots to discuss and learn. Now, before I begin, just a reminder for the live audience: please keep sharing the questions in the chat box. I can see it. So can the panelists during the session, and we'll try to take as many questions as possible as we go along, right? So yep. So let's begin the session. Uh, the first one that I have uh, is a question again that. Uh, you know, in fact, it, it, it was plaguing me as well personally. That what is that one challenge that you know all of you think that continues to impact women at the workplace? So, uh, and I would like all of you to be as spontaneous and and and, and to answer this question. You you can choose in, whoever wants to go first. I can. I don't mind. Um, sure. I think the challenge that I face at work uh, workplace um, is for women not to negotiate. I kind of find it very bothersome, and I'll speak more about it as we go on. But um, I think women, for some reason, uh, either do not believe that they can negotiate or do not want to. So I think that's my biggest um, challenge, if you ask me, since you're only giving me one option. <laughs> okay, no, no, you can, okay, you can even maybe if it's something is really plaguing you, you can share a second challenge as well. Exactly. Please go ahead. Now, let my colleagues speak, and um, sure. if we don't sure. hear, we, we can always share more. Yeah. Thank you. But, but that's very interesting. A start, yeah, Ekta, yeah, yeah. Not not negotiating enough. I think it's a very interesting start. Yeah, I'll, I'll let maybe you know Babita or Susan take the next one. Yeah, so that one challenge. So I don't think I can zero it down to just one challenge. Uh, for me, it's about stereotyping and gender, which has multiple offshoots. Whether you're talking about courage, voice, you're talking about pay equity, gender parity, whatever it is that you want to talk about, I think it's how we make women feel in the workplace. And that stems out of probably a, a sense of inadequacy, a sense of fear in how they operate as well. I think it's the environment that matters. So for me, it's stereotyping and unconscious bias would be the, the, the foundation for which these, these negative energies spill up. So we've got a lot of work to do uh, from that yeah. space. To echo what Ekta is saying, there's a ton of things. It's very difficult to zero on one, but there's better things that, that contribute to this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean that's maybe an unfortunate truth that 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 bias sort of exists, right, as an underlying reason. But yeah, we will we'll get along. Okay, and I'll discuss this further. Shweta, um, because I have to pick one, Alexa. It will be a lack of flexibility, and I say that uh, being very conscious of the fact that in the last uh, decade or so, organizations have become more and more conscious of well-being at work, of building an inclusive workplace. But I still feel flexibility because I think we are still um, zillions of miles away from reaching a point when uh, you know one's career is going to very very seamlessly make space for everything else that one is uh, hobbies, passion, personal interests, personal responsibilities. Although although as a community we have started doing a lot towards that, I still feel we have miles to go. So for me, it's flexibility. Great, super, super. Babita, I think one that uh, always has resonated with me, and it resonates with me as well in my career is somewhere. I think we need to be bold in asking, raising our hands, and ask for it, right? And I often have seen with myself and uh, in the ecosystem where other women are there. there is a hesitance there is a confidence gap there is always there is you know a thought behind should i say or should i not say what if i'm turned down right do i really you know um would i be heard right is it right for me to say there are so many questions that we overload our head that we forget yeah. that simple thing to do is raise your hand and ask for it worst what will happen is you will be denied and then will come the skill of the negotiation which is a very beautifully put it yeah. but first yeah. speak yeah. right ask for it i mean why to keep the, you know keep our if if we uh, for example if we need a day off because it is that day right in the month and we need to have a day off walk up and ask that yes we need a day off right if we say that i didn't understand yeah. why i didn't get promoted walk up and ask that why didn't i right what is it that i need to do and i think there is a lot of hesitance and it's um it's very interesting like you know often um, uh, one of the women leaders in my previous organization in one of the diversity forums has mentioned that ever read your performance appraisal how you write it as a women vis-a-vis -vis of your male colleague how do they write it and you would see the contrast and the difference and that's the confidence gap and i think i think we need to be bold as simple as it is that's a fascinating observation which you had and i immediately make a, made a note that you know i'll go back and check how the appraisal sort of form sort of read differently right so that's beautiful and i really liked how you sort of you know connected back to what it you know mentioned in the beginning right so the 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 lack of willingness to sort of negotiate how it's connected to the thing about not asking enough questions super samta so you know i was uh, i chanced to have some interesting conversation with very young women who work in my team just before this uh, you know i wanted to get their point of view and uh, i feel that something some something very peculiar that kind of hit me is uh, you know these smart women who are joining the workforce or you know in in entry level positions with 2 3 years of experience uh, very self confident and very self assured um uh, you know more often than not what 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 we don't realize is, is that in larger companies or you know when there are too many people in the company they they tend to be certain conversations like the subconscious bias i think that susan was talking about that comes in very naturally subconsciously in informal coffee table conversations it could be as simple as you know what this girl is wearing wearing for example or you know if she styled her hair differently uh, on a certain day and uh, uh, i i think the peculiarity is that you know sometimes people who are talking about these things don't realize that you know it's hitting somebody or it's offending somebody in a certain way uh, and uh, uh, these conversations tend to sort of start taking for granted and we don't realize that you know how often uh, you know the person we are talking about the women we are talking about probably are not comfortable with that kind of conversations so i think this undercurrents of you know things that get taken taken for granted as coffee table conversations that are not okay i think that's 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 what i feel is the biggest challenge uh, in the workplace right now no that that's such a rich uh, you know sort of space that samta you sort of you know took me to because it you got, it took me back and at this i need to share with the panel and the audience here at one point in my career i was managing this brand which 
took a point of view in the domain of women empowerment to sort of challenge the conditioning that sort of affect the society around us to which sort of you know manifests itself into the different compromises that we end up making right and which probably leads to the bias that's there and then the small small things which people don't realize but it's a you know some total and the result of all the conditioning that has sort of happened since they were kids so fascinating space and the reality which unfortunately exists so couldn't agree more with you samra Cool. So, uh, but moving on, I think Ekta, I have a question for you. So, uh, when do you see women professionals sort of leaving their job, and you know what can we do to prevent it? Maybe. Yeah, that's a uh, interesting question, and um, one that I think I'll take a few minutes, unlike my previous one, to explain. Um, I'm confident that all the people who are listening, irrespective of the gender, will realize and recognize that it's not one time suddenly that you know women just up and about and leave right there are stages so most organizations i can confidently say probably at entry level are at least in the technology space perhaps hiring 40 plus percent of women many organizations i know are equal 50 50 like my current organization we hire 50 percent women at entry level for sure now what happens though when you go to leadership that in many or most reports that we read or organizations is less than 15%. So where do the women fall off? Um I think the first is I'm going to tie it back to the negotiation. The first is when women tend to get married. I have no idea why, but especially in India and since I've worked uh, globally I can say especially in India, um it's always assumed that the woman is going to give up her career, right? She's going to relocate if the person is not in the same um city or country why i have no clue why do we not sit down and have a dialogue of why should i be the one quitting why shouldn't you be the one have you know relocating so that's one first place where i think um we tend to organizations tend to have attrition lifestyle right second milestone in women's life typically is when they become mothers so motherhood again um there's an expectation and i'll i'll share my story there's an expectation always that women will um many many times i've had conversations where women say hey um i have to dedicate this time for my child and yeah that's a choice probably some of us will take and some of us will say hey you know what i'm going to continue being a mother my philosophy um is that i can balance both um i think my daughter just gave me a beautiful card this morning which kind of made my day she said i'm the best mother in the world i'm confident each of our kids do feel that we are the best mothers i mean I thought my mother was the best in the world. I mean, who doesn't? Um having said that, it is a very powerful thing the way she drew me, you know? I mean, she did a sketch and the way she drew me was actually with a bag leaving the house, which is typically me, you know? I'm I'm traveling 3 weeks in a in a month. In COVID, I stayed home so I hopefully bonded with her. Uh, but I made the conscious choice not to leave workplace. That's the second stage of women's career where many people Instead I sat down and actually had a conversation with my husband and he was the one who said you know what let's build the support system let's not let you not give up let's find someone to take care of the child let's make sure you know your parents live close by my family lives nearby have your friend circle etc so i think we need to invest in that the third i think is when the children are a wee bit older and their education high school etc comes into play again um i've seen quite a few um you know women tend to leave at that stage or elder care so we've built someone for 5 years 6 years when you know the motherhood stage comes 10 15 years we've invested in in herself and then she gives up a career naturally we don't have women leaders and we turn around and say oh where did we go to uh, the point that shweta was mentioning about flexibility look at that i mean if you were able to give flexibility to women pre covid i'm talking right we wouldn't be losing those uh, professionals they'd continue working in the organization so i don't think in in conclusion i don't think it's one stage it's multiple stages and through this the fact that if we are not able to sit up have conversations if we are not able to tell people what we want for heaven's sake no one is psychic the last time i checked out so no one is going to be able to read our minds let's make sure that we speak up and ask what we want and if we do i don't know how many times i have said no to anybody if they've come to me and asked for anything 
So I guess keep that in mind as women professionals more than men. And the last thing I, I do want to say with this, I'm going to turn it back to you, Alekia, which is, I think through all these stages, one of the critical aspects is risk taking. Women, we tend not to take risk, you know. For example, I recollect doing a training session in my one of my previous organizations, and I was talking about Strengths Finder, right? And I had all the women, top performing women in the organization sort of do the test. And we had 30 smart women mid-management in the room. Um, and when I told that women don't take risk, and the example I gave was women tend to read a particular topic or a subject. They may know everything. They may know 80%. But until they know 100%, they are not going to be able to say, yes, I will do this. Men, on the other hand, they can read just the index. They haven't even opened the book, my friend. They've just read the index. They'll say, yes, tell me, what do you want? I will do it. That's the difference between men and women. And one of them just started laughing. I said, what happened? So she said, oh, my God, Ekta, you're not going to believe. And she kind of opened LinkedIn and showed this image of her husband's screen which her husband, by the way, had just picked up the book, just read the cursory index and wrote everything about Strengths Finder that he could find. And here is the lady who's finished taking her Strengths Finder, knows what her top five strengths are, and is struggling to say, you know what, I know my strengths. So I think to all that point, it's just that ability that women should say, I am willing to take that risk. Babita said it very nice, ask. I would probably just take it a step forward because I am passionate. And not just say ask, but say, take that risk. Big deal. What's going to happen? You'll fail. You learn something from it. Trust me, you'll learn more than being successful if you fail. That's at least how I see it. But that's long answer like I promised. Loved it, Ekta. Loved every bit of it. And I think I mean, the stage-wise actionables that you charted out for not just, I think, HR leaders, but even function heads like me, probably, to, to, to sort of jot down and, and do something about it. And great. I loved the last bit where you sort of segued Babita's previous answer from uh, asking more and actually going beyond that and then connected with back to the risk taking. Super. And on that note, the next question is for you, Babita, that in the journey of expanding leadership opportunities to women, what are some of the hiring strategies that can contribute to making a difference? And specifically, what role do you think can campus hiring play? Right. Hmm. Interesting question, because I think we have been asking this question for very many years, right? And still the needle has not moved across the levels. And I'm sure that's true even today. Um, however, in last couple of years, when you look at the hiring strategy, I think people have become a bit more creative, a bit aware. And I'll segment this answer into three parts. One is that what do we do when we go into talent attraction bit of it? Second is the process. Third is the culture, right? Now, if you look at the talent attraction, right, you will find that a lot of organizations will have talent uh, value proposition. Yet to see women talent value proposition. And a women talent value proposition would look little different than your overall umbrella of talent value proposition because in there you will bring in women leaders and the male allies to talk about that what does inclusion and diversity means in your organization what does the representation across the levels means how your process and policies are inclusive right who are some of the leaders who have advanced in that organization for very many years what are the typical niche roles where you have women representation that gives the confidence for the women in the market to say hey this is an organization where women are thriving just not surviving i might as well not screen myself out while applying you know in the previous answer i was talking about the confidence gap and what it leads to is that women themselves screen themselves out on an application so if you ever see the recruitment funnel, the, your biggest drop is at the application level. If the application is in and, you know, then the interview stage, high chances are women getting selected for the role, right? So that's, that's the on the attraction bit of it. I'll add second point to the attraction is that, um, and it, it's kind of a, a kind of a dream project if ever I could get to do is, and I've done it in some bits and part of it where the organizations can come together, create a forum, right? Invite women, working women, 
women taking career breaks, so and so forth, and impart those skills and the bites of the confidence, mentoring, so and so forth, the network. Networking is a you know very uh, uh, alien subject for the women. Very difficult for women to network. If the woman is not an extrovert and has an, a you know a personality where they can say hi to anybody and so and so forth. Very, very difficult. Men do it like this, right? Now, if you talk about those bit of a skills and bridge that confidence gap, you know, and it would require a concentrated effort of many organizations coming together and doing that, we will shorten that confidence gap and again increase the pipeline. The idea is to increase the pipeline, increase the candidate slate, right? Now, let me touch two points on the process bit of it. First is the job descriptions. Still, there are job descriptions which uses the word like, you have to be assertive communicator, right? You have to be like ninja code cracker or code developer, so and so forth. Women don't relate to these words. These are very male words. This is this is like male psychology versus women psychology. Right now, there is a lot of technology in the market which kind of you know weeds out those kind of a language and brings in the inclusive language in job description. We have to make a little bit more effort. Like my first effort was in an uh, in a job description. What I had read, he should do this this. I said, what do you mean by he should do this this? Are you really saying in the job description you are inviting only male uh, you know applicants? No, right? But when the when the manager was writing the job description, see how the how the, how the psychological effect is. That person didn't realize that he was writing he. It just happened unconsciously that he should do something while he was okay to hire even a woman, right? So we, I think, need to be a little bit more alert on that piece of it. Um, third on the culture is that um, in every people practice, specifically in the hiring, however, may we say that there are certain biases which comes up. Biases comes up when we interview. Biases comes up when we look at the, you know, education profile of the women candidate or the experience, so and so forth. We have to take a little bit of an extra step to train our managers, you know, uncovering those biases, whether it's conscious or unconscious. And we uh, and, and have a panel which is a little diverse panel because when you have women in an interview panel, it brings a little different kind of a perspective as well. So there are those couple of, it, and there is no one single strategy which will work. It has to be a combination of multiple things at multiple stage in the entire hiring um, end to end process, right? Uh, that will help us to kind of, you know, strengthen the pipeline than what we see. And it, it has to be a little bespoke. For, if, if it's a hiring at a mid level, you would do it a little differently. At a senior level, you would do it differently, right? For niche roles, you would do it differently. So there is a thought that needs to be put. To Perfect. And Babita, on the campus hiring bit, any point of view you had, you had that specific to campus? I was just reading through some of the, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, so I, I'm, I'm a, um, I get attracted to anything which is creative, which is out of the whack, right? People have not experimented, right? Music to and my I ears as a marketer, doing, Babita. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I love doing experiments. I, I'm, mm. I'm kind of known for that. And I was reading through one of the HBR articles recently where Unilever had gone to campuses, which is women only, you know, interviewers. They landed on the campus to hire uh, technologists from the campus. And just imagine the energy that they created on the campus, right? That's a little strategic thought in terms of how you approach the campus. Right. So these are the little things on a camp because campus plays a very big role at the early stage of the career. As you know, someone was saying that, you know, your uh, percentage representation of men and women are quite equal or probably women you will find in some campuses more. Right. So it, at the entry level, it's a very rich field. It's it's how you attract them. What do you show them as their career path inside the organization? And hence, the representation and inclusion culture inside the organization is very important. How do you onboard them? How do you assimilate them? That will ensure that how many of your campus hires really grew in the career path in the organization. So that's that's where I see campus playing a very, very huge role. Super, super, super helpful. And, and you know, as we sort of plan our next season's campus hiring, uh, you know, strategies, I think this is a great input which we can use as well for ourselves. Cool. Uh, Shweta, uh, one question for you next. What are the challenges that you think are faced by women in the business community that can be overcome with the right recruitment strategy? 
especially when you know when you are again hiring from campus any other challenges that you sort of uh, you know foresee that you have seen over the years sure <clears throat> so uh, first answering the first part of your question challenges that uh, you know women face i think most of it has been touched upon by many of us uh, here by few of us here particularly but i think top of the mind um, biases uh, or stereotypes second uh, one thing lack of policies for caregiving support i think that's a second challenge because in most of the cases women are the primary caregivers uh, in their families a uh, third uh, lack of sponsorship of leadership roles that's a third one i think that kind of ties to uh, ekta's observation that uh, many times they drop out at or they drop off at their senior leadership roles uh, and the fourth one that i can think of is lack of a conscious intention to build an inclusive workplace i think these four strike me as some of the you know the challenges that most women employees feel face um coming to the second part of your question alakya as to what is it that we can do with recruitment strategy to address this particularly in the campus perspective i just want to clarify one thing and that's my observation um, i think that the recruitment or campus recruitment for that matter uh mostly and fundamentally addresses one aspect of diversity which is representation you know percentage representation of genders across roles but that said i will take up the question what can we do in terms of hiring strategy i think the first question that we need to ask ourselves is who is hiring who is hiring look at your recruiters do your recruiters have a clear understanding of what is your diversity agenda are they bought in into your diversity agenda do, do they have personal conviction around it because those are the individuals who are actually interacting with uh, the potential candidates for your organization so i think that's the first one second thing which has already been touched upon by babita in bits and pieces of course is the overall communication piece what are the communication touch points with uh, campuses um the conversations with the campus placement individual the uh, presentations we go and make in campuses how much of that content is about your organization being a woman friendly workplace how much of that communication is about your diversity agenda how much of that communication really showcases you as a well being focused employer that's the second point my third point is um how are you representing your firm or your organization on your website in the media do you come across do you come through to a lay person as an organization that is that is accommodative of women of women's needs that is passionate about diversity so that's the third point um fourth i think uh, the job description i think we spoke about it it's a very tactical point but the way job descriptions are drafted um is their scope for mentioning how flexible you want to be how open you are to hiring across genders that's that's one thing i want to go back to one question you had asked earlier and tie back this question to that you had asked a question about you know where exactly do women drop out you know in my observation i i have seen three points where women drop out one is purely biological maternity leave and then they don't come back a uh, second one is when all of a sudden or with time the nature of a job role changes there's more travel required there's more salesmanship required you know stuff like that the third one is at senior leadership roles now we come back to recruitment in your recruitment strategy in your communication piece do you have personal stories to convince a potential female candidate that these stages in your life are addressed and are taken care of so stories stories of women employees where you can very clearly show them a path that these points in your life are taken care of i think these are some of the things that i can uh, think of for now shweta i genuinely loved a couple of the anecdotes that you mentioned especially and it took me back to a couple of my experience and i would ask a follow up question to the panel here including you like you mentioned about uh, you know preparing for the interview i think the interviewer should also prepare right so and and sort of uh check for the biases one of my previous organizations actually made us go through a rigorous one week in exercise before we went to the campus to hire and dni checks were one of the things that i remember as one of the distinct sections 
in those internal tests that we had to pass before we went to the campuses any such anecdotes that you remember as interviewers as recruiters uh, that sort of you know can be helpful for for you know people watching us or in general as an advice to prepare uh, for the pre interview yeah sure sure um i think that um, you know the most important thing is that um in terms of recruiter and interviewer training i would say it's more training it's less training and more psychological alignment it is not in my control uh, as a function head to get in people with uh, exactly the same kind of thinking that i have because each one's entitled to their own sort of thinking but i think the responsibility of alignment the responsibility of alignment definitely lies with people who are the decision makers um one thing i can one thing i can definitely think of is actually i i, I mean i can't get into details but one time when i was actually hiring for a role i remember one of my recruiters corrected me and it was a very humbling experience i didn't realize that unconsciously i was actually following a stereotype and that position wasn't getting closed and she's still a part of my team and she corrected me and she said shweta just interview this person and i interviewed the person and she was right so it's 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 very easy to be judgmental about stereotypes but we have to also sit back and acknowledge that we all operate from our own stereotypes you will have a kind of stereotype in your head i have a different kind and that's all dictated by our experience so i think i have seen that uh, leaders particularly recruitment heads who do a good job in this space are the ones who are individually very self aware you know they are personally very self aware about their own biases so they do a good job of you know analyzing that oh this is what's really going on uh, going on in this environment um so i think yeah that's that's one thing that i could think of right now super super and and and, and i'll move on to suzan next uh, for your question and that and, you know uh, just wanted to ask you that within linkedin have you seen an increased inflow of women employees and what are some of the solutions that you have probably implemented to accelerate the growth of women at your workplace if you have seen uh, that awesome so we uh, we are a lot more younger company than the stalwarts in the industry today so it's not like we had a phenomenal journey and to be very honest it has been definitely a struggle at various aspects whether it is at the entry level at the mid level at the senior level gradually we made progress with a lot of conscious effort and i think for all the wonderful points everybody said we had to implement all of these midway through because we constantly did a check and balance to see what is it that is not attracting people to the organization is it your brand is it your culture how many what's the point of talking about dni when the women are not even visible on stage we are not even promoting like to shweta's point women's stories when we go to colleges is there a role model of a successful woman in linkedin who a student can look up to we interestingly looking at career starters if we look at career starters in colleges we looked at first in the context of even students right from under graduation leave alone the graduates if you look at the engineering field itself the ratio of men is to women is 8 women to 14 men in a class so somewhere around the line the engineering even in college even though there is a sizable presence they drop off because they might find media communication sales human resources something else much more attractive than pursuing this because probably cloud computing artificial intelligence robotics maybe that is not an area of interest that they want so how do you bring in to inculcate that your stem that you're talking about is science maths all of that is actually worth pursuing as a career so we started with schools so we started engaging with schools at very uh, in the ug category or if you in some schools it's still 11th and 12th where we went to a conscious effort to kind of mentor and coach school students and how to pick a subject and what is it it would my career look like what do i pursue and the more you start talking to women leaders uh, it was a difficult it was definitely difficult to get them into it that was the first part the other thing is how do i change the allyship or the mental makeup of men to actually accept that i have to go forth and bring in diversity because my organization is largely male oriented to begin with so how do i change that mindset so working with them very closely because it's a question of understanding it's not about resistance to change it's about understanding and getting them more personalized examples and saying why it is important to have a diverse thought process in the organization so getting the allyship of our male colleagues so every intervention that we do to increase you know presence of a representation we have allies 
in our organization. We ensure that the men participate just as good, just like how today you are doing this panel discussion, Alekia. So it is, it is, it is fantastic that you know, we're having that gender diversity here as well. So important to get that allyship. So over time, with a lot of, of course, there was recruitment playing a very important role, specific branding initiatives, specific hackathon events. If it's an engineering field, it's, you know, engineers love hacks. So, you know, we had specifically one for women alone. We have, we, you may want to call it a quota system, but at least at the end of the day, there is a concerted effort to ensure that in your pipelining, what Babita was talking about, in your pipelining, there are applicants. And the most important thing is we don't stop with the applicants to understand why is the application not converting into hiring? Where are they dropping off? Is it coding? Is it interview stage? What is your interview panel looking like? Uh, yes, JD, great. They came in, but how are you making them feel comfortable? If it's an all male panel, it puts the woman on the spot. Are you having a diverse panel to ask the right questions? Are there, you, you asked about, is there a training program that keeps done? We do something called interview in for our managers. And this covers, you have to go through this interview in workshop before you become an interviewer. This covers the diversity angle of what do you need to be conscious about? What are things that is permissible to ask and not make the candidate feel uncomfortable, both male and female, right? So I think we had to do multiple areas of interventions. While we're doing the policy interventions, we had to do our recruitment interventions to make it more universally and diversity friendly. And at the same time, we have to focus on career progression and investing in the women that are already in the system. Now, it's once you bring them in, the question is, how do we retain and continue progression in their careers? So where is the conversation? Are women, is, the pay, is there a pay equity problem in the organization? Is there a promotion where people are given equitable opportunities or only the quiet ones uh, get left behind, as we say, or the ones who don't ask don't get a promotion? We need to really sit and sometimes pick on these quiet people and understand what is it that's sticking them. They must be your top talent as well, but their personalities want them to be in that space, right? So including and making them feeling belonged, making a conscious effort from not only from the human resources team, but also from the leadership of the organization to understand where are women placed how are they progressing in the organization? What is it that we need to do to help them grow? I think it is a long journey. To be very honest, we must have marginally increased our intake and we are making very, very conscious, concerted efforts. It was nice to say that when Shweta said that someone reminded her, right, that she was slipping the track, we ourselves do that. We are we 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 judge ourselves. And I think one of the biggest challenges I've also seen is women supporting women. It's a very important part. We we are very we are very successful in our field. We fight for it, but we got to uplift our community as well along with us because we are also helping them to become change agents. So I think multiple factors, uh, right from coaching, mentoring, developing, hiring. I think we tried and did multiple interventions that can increase the presence of women representation in the organization. And it's it's still a long journey. So much to ask and so little time. I've, I've like, like what you just mentioned, there are so many questions that you know I had just jotted down, but I need to move on to ask this next question I need to ask to Samta. So I think if you realize, Samta, what, what the other four on the panel were saying, right down to Susan, you know, that so much of recruitment, the right recruitment has to do with finding the right talent, right? And, and, and that gets conditioned in the education stage, in the education institutes itself, right? So, and since you are a doing in the education fraternity, how, what's, what's it, you know, your thought that how can educational institutes sort of empower women with the right skill sets so that they can fight on an equal footing in the, when they do enter the job market and in the workplace? I just wanted to know that. Thanks, Alikya. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I think a lot has been talked about, you know, the storytelling and the narrative bit. And, you know, I was just thinking about it and two instances come to my mind, you know. Uh, I, uh, we all studied history in our school and we used to hate it. And, you know, I remember there was a particular chapter in history which talked about women in history, right? So uh, the point that, you know, I'm trying to make is that, you know, there are so less women role models to talk about that one has to consciously bring in a chapter to talk about at least those four or five women so that, you know, there is some perception of inclusion, right? Uh, so that's very interesting. And, you know, uh, uh, I remember one month ago we started this, uh, you know, because, you know, we work with the students who come typically from a tier two, tier three university, uh, universities. And uh, we had started a, a, a sort of a news digest uh, for, for our students, which go, goes out on Sunday. So my designer kind of made the digest and we sent, sent out two editions of it. And then immediately after that, I hired a women designer in my team. And right till now, there were two, two men designers. 
and suddenly she noticed she's like the news digest that's going out has a man as a mascot on the first page why is it not a women as a mascot and you know the first thing she changed within two two days she joined is she just changed the design of that newsletter and the first the cover page of that newsletter letter became a you know like a women mascot saying that okay i'm going to bring you news updates every 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 sunday right so these are these are really interesting sort of two instances that sort of uh, you know i want i want to bring in as to you know how we how how we talk about you know how do we empower women in the uh, in the institutions because most often than not we tend to emulate in the early entry uh, in the entry level of a career we tend to emulate the skills and you know the kind of narratives we have been sort of groomed in as part of the education program and that is what is completely missing right now you know there there is a lot of di- gender diversity but really you know let's be honest we're talking only you know very premier tier one institutions are the ones who are talking about it uh, we can't even imagine the issues that you know the women uh, in tier when it comes to tier 2 tier 2 and tier, tier 3 schools what they kind of i'm extremely sorry uh, so i think i think i think three things uh, three things that we must definitely do one is that how do we bring in uh, really the narrative and how do we bring in women as role models in the curriculum itself so how do we integrate them how do we tell stories about you know successful women what they go through what a success look like what are the kind of obstacles they face uh, uh, you know in their journey to success so definitely you know integrating more role models and narratives and stories of successful women in the curriculum is wise one uh, the second thing is uh, uh, you know the second thing is that uh, a lot of women when it comes to workplace uh, they struggle to have a voice and they struggle to talk about you know very simple issues like you know we were talking about you know menstrual leave for example like you know it's it's so painful i can't come to office but it's difficult to talk about and to ask ask that right so i think just enabling these kind of open spaces as part of the education as part of the institutions you know if we if we get if if we make it a norm that it's okay to talk about this in the education institutions they will probably not even think twice before let's say alekha coming to you and saying listen i'm not feeling well today and you know i just want to stay home and it's as simple as that right i don't need to go see a doctor i just need to rest right so i think that's the second thing and the, and the third bit is really um, you know something that i noticed in one of the campuses i was visiting one of our campuses i was visiting is really how do we start with women representation at the level of the classroom itself and uh, you know i happened to uh, i happened to i happened to go to two three colleges last month and uh, in one of the classrooms i observed that the the head of the classroom or the class monitor were two women and in another place i observed there were two men and when you sit through those classrooms those classrooms function very different differently the discipline is very different i mean the seriousness and you know the kind of the substance that comes in okay you need to start the class on time and you know this is how the class is going to run that changes completely and you know we're talking about workplace but you really start seeing that at the level of you know classroom when they when they in the first year second year third year so i think these are really important things that you know how do we start making some of these things as a norm while they are studying so that you know let's so so that it doesn't even strike them twice when they actually enter the workplace that you know how do we talk about issues or you know um how do we think of women role models so i think some of these changes is what we need to start at the level of you know uh, higher education i would even say k12 all your matter super 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 sharp answer samta as always and uh, ekta and suzan i have a question for the two of you and and if you want to react to the last question as well that how can opportunities for leadership uh, be expanded towards new recruits to bridge the gap that might remain i think that's a nice segue from the campus sort of initiating stage so corresponding to leadership what's your perspective ekta suzan if you both of you one of you want to go ahead and if you want to react to the last part as well on campus yeah yeah, yeah i'd love to suzan if uh, is okay with with you so uh, first things first i think the mind shift change has to happen at education it cannot happen at workplace let's be practical um yes we will mold them at workplace but a lot of damage if i may use the word is already done when we are going through the education system here in india it is forcing us to you know be very competitive uh, but not necessarily teach you life skills it's just academic skills team work only comes when you know you come to probably an mba kind of a platform or program now i recollect going to campus and asking this question and even in virtual mode because you can see all of you know all the participants i asked this question in a very interesting manner which is how many of the students that are listening in today have both their parents working both their parents working 
typically it's less than 10% of the class that raises the hand. Both the parents working is the question. It's not job. Just 10%. So the remaining 90% have only one parent that's working. Working. All right. So I then pose the next question and very smartly in my mind, I think smartly, I ask them and I say, so the remaining 90%, you have one parent, either your mother or your father, that's not working. And they say, yes, they are not working. All of them nod and they say not working. So I then go on to say that means being a homemaker is not working. You're basically doing nothing. You're sitting at home and your mothers are, are doing nothing. And that's when the light bulb, actually, you can see that in the conversation. It kind of goes off. Yeah. Like, oh, my God, what did I said? I use the word working. I didn't say job. I didn't say career. I didn't say earning. I used working. Right. So that's a huge mindset shift that uh, the children and thankfully the new generation, I think, does come in that manner. I do remember meeting one of the young professionals just a month back in my organization and she said something remarkable to me in my conversation. I have this monthly connects in our, uh, you know, at our workplace. She said, you know, your generation is the sacrificing generation. She was talking to me and telling me that my generation is the sacrificing one and her generation is the selfish one. I loved it. I loved the fact that she was able to own that decision and say, I am going to be selfish. It is my life, my career, my choice. I love the fact that somebody who's 22, 23 years old already has got that figured out. I mean, imagine that, right? I wasn't that smart at 22, 23. I can guarantee you. Now, None of us <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, now, coming to the question of leadership, I think it's a lot about um, the first question you asked us. If we were able to break that, I think leadership is formed. You know, the unconscious biases, the negotiation, the flexibility, you break that and you get leadership, in my view, right? Leadership is not about a role, a grade in the organization. It's not. To me, leadership is about accountability. Leadership is about ownership. It could just be even a fresh, young talent from campus that we've hired shows accountability and says, I'm going to get this done. And I don't have to chase. I don't have to follow up. That's leadership for me. I mean, I trade that person any day vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, a leader in the organization by designation, but someone that I assign a task and someone who is not proactive, doesn't come and, you know, share details. To me, that's not leadership. So three key attributes, being proactive, being accountable, and having ownership, I think, to me, is leadership. How can women do that? By simply raising their hand before a question is asked. That's how I put it, probably. Yeah, yeah I, you. I like how it, you sort of closed the loop and came back to your first answer that I don't negotiate <laughs> and then sort of, yeah, I, so, so loved it. I swear that's really critical. And my husband taught me how to negotiate, FYI. So, hey. <laughs> right, right, right. Suzanne, now, yeah, I think you, I am awaiting your answer on this as well, your take on this. And okay. I just combine one of the audience questions and slowly, guys, I'll just bring in the audience questions as well. And in fact, a specific question for you, Suzanne. So two questions for you to answer, apart from the leadership hiring bit. Can you help with some examples of how you encourage the women candidates at LinkedIn to help them climb up the leadership ladder without any bias? And by the way, I really like your background of LinkedIn, which has pretty di good diverse uh, symbols. And I think they will Yes, I'm good glad you can see it that close. <laughs> but anyway, I loved Ekta's passion on negotiation. I must say we are all great negotiations when it comes to vegetables and shopping. So let's not be little women about that. We are solid in that. Uh, but from the context of what she said, I mean, I don't want to keep repeating because everything is absolutely valid. I think also teaching women at a very young age about failure is very important. Also saying that, you know, there are a lot of people who say, how does how does my mom or dad reach this elevated leadership position in the organization? How do my mentors, you know, get so successful or my coaches or my professors or whoever is in a leading team? But teaching them how that they will face hardships throughout the way, right? They will face biases. They will face pushbacks and not to run away. And how do you fight that over to keep coming back is a very important lesson that during their career journey. So career coaching for young campus recruits is a very important one. Understanding with real life examples, what is probably by the time they reach their employable age or environment, it'll be very different. Things might hopefully be much easier. But I think giving them that coach, giving them individual mentorship, 
dedicated corporate mentorship where they're actually people are coming, visiting them, spending time with them, talking to them about careers and how they take it. I think they get a perspective about leaders because leaders are humans themselves. They could be personified with a different, with a title, with a name, with the kind of things that we see on probably on our OTT platforms. I and mean, that's not necessarily leadership, but we they have to kind of experience what is le real leadership. So sending them for kind of coaching and mentoring sessions with organizations, which we've tried on several occasions, does help if you want to start young and, and take them through that journey of hardship, definitely, for sure. Now, to coming back to the second question on, I think somebody by name Arjun had asked that question. I am Arjun, I'm not going to say that there is not going to be bias because a lot of sometimes the bias about a person becoming a leader is also within themselves. The lack of confidence, uh, the voices, what Babita, Ekta and Samata kept saying about negotiation, asking, wanting to fight up, wanting to be heard, wanting to be seen is a very important part. You have to be driven. And as a woman, I'm sorry, but we will have some challenges in life all the time because it's not possible to change the world in the way people think. There will be stereotypical situations of probably motherhood, family situations, compromises. For every compromise that we're doing with our family, the question is, do I have to give up on my family situation in order to become a leader or vice versa, right? So what happens is you take a back seat and say, let me prioritize my family over my leadership ambitions. Now, that's where someone needs to coach them to come out and say, no, I have to try and see how can I balance the two? Can an organization help me balance the two? So I think what we would do at LinkedIn is typically we ask these very pertinent questions. And when I say ask, I think it's a responsibility of a business leader. It's a responsibility of the head of an organization. It's a responsibility of human resources as well to ask people who make these decisions, look at your list of people who are promoted. Where are the women here? Why is this individual not going up the value chain? What is it that we need to help? What kind of investment in terms of learning, coaching, training, flexibility? What can we offer? So it is a very, very deep conversation that we have to have. And periodically, without losing momentum, we have to keep doing it over and over again because some things just get forgotten. So I think specific focus on helping women to get out of their comfort zone, out of their difficult zone, coming out into the open, speaking up, voicing their views, participating equally. Because I will tell you a very quick story. When you talk a lot, when a woman speaks loudly or us, she's seen as aggressive. But when a man uh, speaks, it's sometimes seen as respectful. And I've seen that myself in my career as well. You're termed as aggressive because your voice is an opinion, right? But Keeping that bias behind and coming forward is a very important aspect. So I think a lot of investment on career progression, a lot of investment on coaching and encouragement and providing the absolute perfect environment in terms of flexibility for them to work, you will definitely see women flourish. And I've heard fantastic stories from, be it from banking sectors or from FMCG leaders across, you can name some of the leaders who've gone through a lot of hardship those days, which was even more difficult. Today, I think we have women leaders and organization who are encouraging diversity and inclusion. So getting those leadership positions should not be tough, but it's about you should want it and you should work for it and you should ask for it as well. And we can support that system for sure. Perfect. Um, Babita, coming to you next. So what, and then sort of, this is a question I'll now go around the room asking each one of you. What's that one advice you would like to share with fellow women leaders linked to your own personal journey in the HR community? Uh, be wise to make your be wise to make your choices, and once you have made your choice, stick with it. Come what may, but uh, ensure that you are you you are wise enough to create an ecosystem around you. If you are careeristic, for example, I've been a careeristic, and I ensure that I create an ecosystem around me, which helps me to thrive and make my career right. So be wise to make your choices, whether it's your education, whether it's your husband, the kind of a family you want to be in, whether you want to have a kid or not have a kid, where do you want to go in a career, so on and so forth, because that's the choice only you can make. Nobody else can make it for you. And once you have made it, ensure that you, you know, you are, you are not leaving any stone unturned to really get, get what you want. Super. Shweta? Same question, yeah. Your take sure, one sure. advice, yeah. Um, my advice is do not enter your careers with a prejudice that it's tough out there for women by default. Because if you enter your careers and approach your careers with an existing prejudice, you will miss out on the opportunities and the people who are there to support you. So approach it with clarity in terms of your own goals, take a stand, 
speak your mind, experience your journey. And one additional thing to keep in mind to succeed, it's not it's not necessary to give up on your feminine traits. Empathy, intuition, and sensitivity are very crucial to success and they're enablers. So yeah, those are two advices, but that's what I could think of from my own personal experience. I, I, I'm so thankful to you for adding the second, but I, I could identify with it very strongly as a marketer. Yeah. So Samta, your take on this. So I like, you know, I also have two, but I'll be very quick. I think one is that, you know, I, I heard a phrase called bringing up the elevator, uh, you know, which is once you have unleashed, uh, you know, a certain leadership role, it's, 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 it's kind of our job as leaders to sort of take the elevator down and really bring up women in that elevator. And that's one. I think the second, the second point and something that's repeated is, you know, uh, uh, I think, I think one advice to women leaders and, you know, smart women entering the system is that, you know, we will encounter two kinds of men, like, you know, three kinds of men. One, one is set of men who are natural allies, you know, who understands their agenda. But, you know, there are, there are men who are just on the fence, you know, even the most well-intentioned men sometimes are so sort of, you know, uh, tied by the bias that all they need is some kind of a nudge or somebody to educate them. And uh, uh, so just go out and educate the men around you because the more allies that we have in the environment. And uh, I think my advice is that, you know, don't judge men just by the initial reaction, but just go out of your way and create allies uh, and add to this whole community. Super, super. Ekta, your take is on the last parting advice. I think I'm going to stick with what I'm very passionate about, um, which is I think women should strive to, to have negotiations. I keep saying that, which in turn is going to give them financial independence. I think if women have that, um, they can actually do everything else. It pretty much falls into place. That was one of the things my mom told me when I was in high school. She said, you should never be like me that you have to ask your father or your husband or your brother. Thankfully, we didn't have brothers for money. So I have today reached a stage where others ask me and I'm like, oh, totally cool about it. So yeah, to me, financial independence, I think, is what message I'll give to women. And that will start everywhere. Excellent. And I like the specificity of that advice and the relevance of it. Loved it. So then lastly, you, your, your, your advice. My advice is women don't forget the other women. They don't have to go through what you went through. Be there for them. Take them through their journey. Let it happen. Let it be easier for them as well. So it's advice for everyone to take your sisters in arms along with you into that journey and, and you know, show them the way. So. Loved it. And I think I'll connect it back to one of the pointers that I think Babita mentioned before she left that on networking, right? The need for uh, networking and how it's even more relevant for this cohort, right? So, uh, yeah. And then I, I think a, a great point again. And thank you everyone for the, you know, the, the, the participation and an absolutely enthralling session. I have like a couple of pages full of notes, genuinely speaking. And I'm sure the, the, the audience watching us also had lots, lots to you know take home from this. And thanks to the audience as well for the questions, for sharing the insights. Uh, now, you know, I would like to hand it over back to Asmani for the closing closure of the session. Thank you so much, Alekya, and thank you to the lovely ladies, Ekta, Susan, Babita, Shweta, and Samta for helping answer the big question of women empowerment in leadership roles. With this, we are going to wrap up today's session. It has been a pleasure hosting you all. We would also like to thank our partner, Sunstone Adversity, and our esteemed panelists for the invaluable information they have shared with us today. Please share your feedback with us in the link shared in the chat window as your feedback matters. Do stay tuned for uh, do stay tuned to your inbox for details on our next session as part of Talent Talks in partnership with Sunstone Adversity. Have a great day ahead and a very happy Women's Day and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.